We talked a little bit about why we need templates in the previous lecture, but to properly use them we are still missing two important parts of the equation. The what, as in what is it that they actually do, and the how, as in how to use them without shooting our leg off. Today we focus on the what. We will try to build an intuition about what the compiler does when we write templated code so that we are all on the same page that templates are not black magic. And that intuition behind what they do is actually easier to understand than many fear it to be. First, let's do a small recap of how our executables are generated. We already talked about the full compilation process before, but the gist is that all of our input source files pass through three stages to become executable files. They start by going through the preprocessor that unwraps any macros and includes and creates translation units from our source files. These files are then transformed into object files by the compiler. And finally, the object files get linked together by the linker to form the actual executables. Everything that we discussed today happens in the compiler. So let's discuss what it does when we use a function or a class template. The intuition is that the compiler uses templates to generate code, which also explains their name. A function struct or a class template is just that, a template for normal function struct or a class. And while this is a simplified rule of thumb, it serves as a good intuition for what happens to our templates during compilation. To be slightly more precise, let us illustrate what happens to a simple function template foo during the compilation process. Anytime the compiler encounters a call that it associates to a template, it instantiates a concrete specialization of that function, substituting all of its template arguments for the actually used types. Such specializations are then compiled into their binary form and for all means and purposes behave just like normal functions. If we inspect the resulting object file, we will see all of our concrete functions in it. This, however, means that if we have, say, a function template and use it with many types, we will have many specializations of that function compiled into our binary, one for each combination of types it's used with. For completeness, let's now see how we can check these things by compiling some real code by hand. Well, okay, not by hand, but by using a compiler directly from the command line. For that, we will go back to our maximum CPP file from the previous lecture. It defines the maximum function template and uses it with three different types. Not the most useful code, but a good illustration. We can compile it from the terminal in the same way we compiled code into object files before. Note the minus C flag. We are only interested in compilation into an object file, not the full compilation and linking. This produces an object file maximum.o. This object file is just a binary file in ELF format in Linux or MacO format on macOS, at least by default. But for our purposes, both will equally do. We can inspect these files with the object dump or objdump command. At this point, we're interested in looking at the part of this file that lists all available symbols as symbols table. We can read it by providing the appropriate flags to the objdump executable, the minus T, to get the symbols table and minus C capital to get better looking symbol names. And we expect to see all the compiled function names briefly mentioned there. Now, if we look carefully at this output, which I trimmed a little, we can see there is a underscore main uh, symbol for our main function, as well as three different maximum functions with the types that match those that we used in the main uh, function int, double, and float. Furthermore, if we run this code in the excellent compiler explorer, link below brings you to the same example, we can also see the actual calls to the compiler generated concrete function specializations. We just have to look for call statements in the instructions generated by the compiler. The other details in this output are not too important for us for now. Please do try it all out yourself so that you're sure that I'm not lying to you. Really, you see that these examples take minutes to write and you can learn so much from them. So don't be afraid to fail, try other functions, try more types, try class and struct templates and uh, call their methods that might have templates of their own. Uh, you don't even need to read the documentation at this point, just try what feels like it should work. And if anything doesn't work that you think should work, please feel free to ask any clarifying questions under this video. And after we've experimented with all of this for a while, we might start noticing something. Note, and this is very important, that the compiler is lazy. Only those specializations are generated that are actually used. 
If we didn't use the maximum function, it would not have been compiled at all. Now, if we think about it for a minute, it becomes clear why this is so. Looking at the maximum function template itself in isolation, the compiler doesn't know which types it will be used with. Technically, it could be any type we want. So the compiler cannot and should not compile the code for all the types it knows about. There are multiple reasons for this. It would take ages, it would need to compile a lot of code, the binary size would be huge because it needs to contain all that binary code, and uh, it might still not be enough, as maybe we will give it out as a library. And so we just don't know which types it might be used with. This is actually something that plays a lead role in making splitting templated code between header and source files confusing for beginners. We'll talk about this very soon, but if you understand everything that we talked about here, you should face no issues there too, when the time comes. Okay, so time for a short recap, and after it, we can be sure that we know the most important bits about what is it that the compiler does to our templated code. Long story short, the compiler generates concrete functions, classes or structs, for any template instantiation whenever it encounters such instantiations in the code. It then treats these as any other ordinary functions, classes or structs, and proceeds by compiling them into binary object files. From this point on, these symbols in the object files behave just like any normal class or function or struct, and those we already know about. And that's it. Conceptually, this is everything that happens under the hood when we use templates. Now, there are a lot of intricate details on which exact concrete binary code gets generated depending on how we declare and define our templates, and we will cover this in the next video. Until then, please feel free to watch the video about why we might want to use templates in the first place, if you haven't already. And at this, time to end this video, so as always, thank you for watching, and see you in the next one. Bye!